Hello everybody, it's Rob Moln, robmoln.com, uh, tourist guide, specialist, uh, South African war guide. And uh, tonight I've got quite an exciting video. We're all excited in South Africa because we heard a rumor that they're going to stop alcohol sales again. And I was standing in the queue up the road for a friend, of course. Um, and I was in this queue for about an hour. And uh, so I thought, well, what, what could I present? And in my book, I have a very nice section of subjects that I've gleaned. And one of them is alcohol in the anglo Boer War or the South African War. So I thought, well, let's do that one today. So this is uh, after the Battle of Belmont, uh, and you'll see a medic tending to one of the wounded British soldiers. Now, I'm not sure if there's water in this water bottle or alcohol, but here we have uh, the master of alcohol uh, during the South African War, the commander-in-chief initially of the British forces, uh, General Buller, Victoria Cross. Now, he never went into battle without having a very good supply of champagne. And uh, unfortunately, this affected his judgment very, very severely. And here at the Battle of Colenso, we have a memorial to 29 unknown British gunners who were killed during that battle. Now, it was during Black Week, so-called Black Week, the big British defeats of the South African War. And in this particular battle, 1,138 British soldiers were killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. And on the Boer side, only 50. So there was a huge discrepancy. I mean, he walked into an absolute trap, this Buller, but probably armed with a little bit of champagne. Uh, 10 of the British guns were lost, an absolute disgrace at the time. Um, so this is what another battlefield looked like. Uh, this was Spion Corp, 24th of January, 1900, where 1,185 British soldiers were killed, wounded or captured. And this was the main British trench. And in the background, you will see the Boer position called Allo Knoll. And a lot of these poor men were killed uh, with shots in the right temple. But who was directing the battle, but gave every excuse afterwards? It was, of course, General Buller. But he used to disguise his requirements and say that, I'm searching for the 50 cases of castor oil that you should have sent up last week. And on one occasion, uh, the commanding officer down in Cape Town uh, telegraphed back and he said, Unfortunately, we mislaid the case of 50 cost, uh, cost, castor oil bottles, and, uh, but we've gathered castor oil from all over the camps here, and we've managed to raise about 50 cases. So it would have been a lot better for the British troops if he'd taken castor oil rather than alcohol. Another occasion uh, in December 1900, one of the first battles uh, of the guerrilla phase of the Anglo-Boer War at a place called Helvetia, which is quite near Waterfall Boerven in Mapumalanga. And uh, the Boers um, attacked a very strong British position and overcame it. And as part of the deal, they captured the British rum supply. And of course, all the Boers filled up their water bottles with rum and uh, off they went. And it was quite a merry band that headed back uh, off towards Dahlstrom. And Schickeling, who was uh, a Boer commander, uh, saw the following sight, uh, a horse being led. And on the horse was a British officer. And he had uh, a water bottle that he kept handing down to his captor, who was leading the horse until Eventually, the captor said more, and the officer said, there's no more left. So the Boer said, then get off that bloody horse. And here is uh, 
the little cemetery on the top of Helvetia uh, where the battle took place. Down uh, near the Vaal River in the southern Transvaal, the old southern Transvaal Republic, there was a train uh, that was ambushed late in the afternoon. But the two Boers who were waiting nearby to set off the charges had waited all day in the sun uh, for this train. And eventually they blew it up, came along, but they were absolutely parched. And here you can see contemporary photograph of the train, which is burning. And just note the culvert. It's quite interesting because some years ago we rediscovered the exact place where this happened. And here is the culvert. However, on the train there was a lot of whiskey. And uh, these poor Boers, um, Gert and his brother, were so parched that they just grabbed hold of the whiskey and whatever else alcohol they could find and just drank it down. And after half an hour, they couldn't even walk. So they had to take them back to base, uh, loaded on a donkey cart. But after this was found, we had a great big celebration and we celebrated the whiskey train at the particular culvert. And today, if you go to the little village of Fall near Standerton, you will see this culvert with the memorial. So pop in and, and see Rita Brits um, at the Fall Hotel and she will give you directions on how to find this memorial, which she very kindly arranged uh, together with um, a supporting group that's known as the Boer and Brit. As you can see, this is what the memorial looks like. And it's a memorial to poor Jack and Gert van der Heerfe, who had to suffer uh, this terrible thirst, which was relieved uh, rather suddenly at the end of their adventure. So we move on, and uh, this is my great uncle, Archie Wilson, and he was a gunner with the Royal Field Artillery. And uh, he kept up a long correspondence with my father that started shortly before my father served in the Second, um, uh, the Second World War up in Egypt. And that's where they started a long correspondence that, that only ended in the early 1970s when Uncle Archie passed away. And he wrote about alcohol and he said, it's a very good friend, but a very bad master. And this is the Battle of Cess Malspreit. This is where the 19th Brigade broke through. And on this flat plain here, that's where Uncle Archie, um, 82nd uh, Royal Field Artillery, um, operated his gun, shooting at the Boers, there across the mountains. So it's a bit of personal history here. Uh, then we go to a place uh, which is about 60 kilometers this side of Mafeking. Now during Mafeking there was the famous siege and if you're passing a place called Ottersdal, you'll see a sign at the side of the road that says Die Gat, Bush Pub. Turn off, go there. It's, it's amazing. It's it's a pub that's been built into a, into a cave and uh, the people are very nice uh, and certainly they'll give you lots of anecdotes of the area, which is quite famous because this is the place where on the 30th of December at five o'clock in the morning, uh, Jamison met uh, part of the raiding force that came into, uh, in to try and take over Pretoria and take over the Transvaal Republic. So he set off for the Rhodesian Mashona Land Mounted Police uh, on the 29th of December from Betuwana Land, or what's now known as Botswana, and he met the other half of his force, uh, the Betuwana Land Border Police here at a place called Malmani, which is now known as Otterswip. However, uh, before they entered the Transvaal, they had to cut the telegraph wires. But they'd had a huge party the night before, also on champagne. And apparently, instead of cutting the telegraph wires, they actually cut the fence wires. Um, however, that's, that's a popular story. The real story is that they missed the little branch line 
that went to Pretoria via Zerust. So all along the way, President Kruger and the Commandant General Jaber knew exactly where this raiding force was and, uh, of course, stopped them very abruptly before they even got as far as Krugersdorp. In fact, just outside Krugersdorp on the, on the 2nd of January, 1896. So there you see uh, one of the, one of the um, Betuanaland border police members climbing up a telegraph pole and cutting it. And when, when all this COVID insanity is over, and here is uh, Jamison setting off from Otto's work, then I'd like to take you to a very sleepy town called Otto's Dahl, and this is exactly where Jamison and his raiders set off um, into the Transvaal. And there's even an original telegraph pole that bore witness to the event, and you can still see the manufacturer's name on the telegraph pole. And by the way, in the background, you see an advert for a light beer. Um, you know, we have alcohol all over the place, especially in Otto's Whip. Um, and this pole is right next to a very convenient pub. And um, I'm indebted to my friend, the late Roger Webster, who uh, took me to this place and told me some very interesting stories about Otto's Whip. And here we have the Mafeking Road that ran from Mafeking through to Pretoria. And this is the road that the raiders followed. And it's still there in original condition. So this is one of the, the gems that I can show you um, out in the Northwest province. And there's my friend, uh, Roger Webster, who passed on in January this year. And there he is, uh, beer in hand, relating a, some very interesting stories about Otto's Whip. And one of them I'm going to end up with, uh, this is the cemetery uh, very close to, to the pub, the hut, the hole, and there's some really interesting graves. And I can keep you entertained there uh, for probably half the day or morning, and we would have to retire to, to the hut pub uh, to discuss what we've seen. But this particular headstone is very interesting because it's very unusual, as you can see. Um, it's almost handmade out of slate, and it's got a cross on the top and some vine leaves. And on the bottom, it's got a really unusual and scary uh, carving. And it's a carving of the skull and crossbones. So one wonders, my goodness, what on earth could this be? So if we take a closer look at this, um, you'll see that uh, this is in memory of Magdalena Elizabeth Kuhn, who was born to Toy, and her husband was uh, J.L. Kuhn. So she was born uh, on the 10th of May, 1879. This is not very clear. And she was married on the 2nd of November, um, 1896, uh, to J.L. Kuhn. Ah, but when did she die? She died the very next day. She died on the 3rd of November, 1896. So what is the story here? I mean, what kind of man was her husband? So uh, late Roger Webster and his wife Debbie did a lot of research and they came up with the answer. And the answer, of course, lay in alcohol. And uh, after the wedding, during the course of the celebrations, uh, one of the friends of J.L. Kuhn came up to Magdalena and said, do you know that your husband actually has a, a child um, uh, by the maid that he employs at the farm. And she said, no. So she went off and she asked him, she said, do you have a child? And he said, yes, I do. I have a son. And he's about uh, eight years old. And so Magdalena was so upset that she went and she took poison. And that is the answer to what this is. If you look at a Victorian poison bottle, this is the skull and crossbones that you'll see on the bottle. And above it is inscribed, Rest in Frieda, rest in peace. 
And there we're going to leave the Jamison Raiders. There were 600 of them. And um, this is a little cemetery uh, where very close to where the Jamison Raiders spent their last miserable night. And five of the Raiders are buried here, just next to the main road between Krugersdorp and Ranfontein. And uh, before general recycling of um, precious and not so precious metals, uh, this still remain. And it's a quote which is very appropriate to the Jamison Raiders. And it comes from Lord Tennyson's poem, the charge of the light brigade and it says theirs was not the reason why to reason why theirs was but to do or die and that's from lord Ten tennyson's poem and of course you remember you might re recall some of the other words it said into the valley of death rode the 600 so it was very appropriate memorial to the 600 men of the jamison raiders Recruiting sergeant came to the streets of Rochester, home from the war, home from the wars in the low country. And he sang, yeah, so I'm about ready now. A recruiting sergeant came to the streets of Rochester, home from the wars in the low country. And he sang as he marched and he played upon his kettle drum, who'll be a soldier for Marlborough and me? Who'll be a soldier? Who'll be a soldier? Who'll be a soldier for Marlborough and me? And he sang as he marched and he played upon his kettle drum. Who'll be a soldier for Marlborough and me? For the Queen, she has ordered fresh troops for the continent to fight against the French in the low country. So if you'd be a soldier, all in scarlet uniform, Come be a soldier for Marlborough and me. Come be a soldier, come be a soldier, come be a soldier for Marlborough and me. So if you be a soldier, all in scarlet uniform, come be a soldier for Marlborough and me. Oh, not I, said the butcher, nor I, said the mason, and most of the people wouldn't but agree to be paid in the powder and the rattle of the cannonball. Wages for soldiers for Marlborough and thee. Wages for soldiers, wages for soldiers, wages for soldiers for Marlborough and thee. To be paid in the powder and the rattle of the cannonball. Wages for soldiers for Marlborough and thee. Oh, but I said the young man who'd long endured Paris Jews, no more charity for the likes of me. Though starvation and danger, they shall be my destiny. I'll take the king's shilling for Marlborough and thee. I'll take the king's shilling, take the king's shilling, take the king's shilling for Marlborough and thee. Though starvation and danger, they shall be my destiny. I'll take the king's shilling for Marlborough and thee. So forty recruits marched through the streets of Rochester, bound for the wars in the low country. And they sang as they marched through the crowded streets of Rochester, Who'll be a soldier for Marlborough and thee? Who'll be a soldier? Who'll be a soldier? Who'll be a soldier for Marlborough and me? And they sang as they marched through the crowded streets of Rochester, Who'll be a soldier for Marlborough and me?